Um, so now, um, welcome to the uh, uh, Pamela Undergraduate Forum. I did started this a little bit late, so you missed two wonderful presentations, but we still have more to come. And so our next presenter um, is uh, Emma Coben. Emma Coben is a third year undergraduate student at the University of Southern California and is currently studying political science. She is primarily interested in political theory as well as international affairs and regional politics. Coben plans on obtaining a master's degree in international affairs following the conclusion of her education at USC. And um, her paper for today is titled Ultraviolence, um, Bong Joon-ho's use of physical gore, um, physical gore as a representation of political force. Oh, thank you. Hello, I'm sharing my screen, sorry. Okay, so today I wanted to talk about the idea of violence as a structural concept. So my presentation is called Reconceptualizing Violence Through Art Artistic Representation. So before we begin, I like to think about the way that we conceptualize violence now, um, the popular idea of what violence is, what it looks like. Um, it usually is imagined to have a perpetrator and a victim that are easily deline delineable. And it usually coincides with an idea that is put forth through the concept of the law and um, how we conceptualize violence between one another in a lens through the law. So the purpose of my paper that I wrote is to assert the importance of the general public's understanding of structural violence as pervasive and implicating and to address art's role in the endeavor to better understand structure, structural violence. Um, my thesis is that although, well, first I'll define subjective and objective violence. Subjective violence is a type of violence that dominates the media and popular discourse at large. It is usually the most, one that um, affects the senses the most because it's most immediate. And it's a type that um, is between usually um, an identifiable perpetrator and victim, usually the type that we'd see in the news, that sort of violence, and objective violence as used as a term in most, in academia now is um, structural violence, which is just as forceful and has enduring effects, but it's not as uh, visibly noticeable sometimes, and it can manifest over time and not be as instant as subjective violence. And objective violence is, interesting because it can sometimes implicate all of us without our knowing that we might be responsible in some way in some sort of um, structural violence. So with that said, my thesis is that although subjective violence is largely understood and opposed as morally wrong, objective violence is equally as pervasive and harmful and can be reconceptualized through artistic avenues such as film and television in order to move us towards a less violent world. And in order to mitigate both forms of structural and interpersonal violence, it's critical that violence is understood holistically. So I argue that it's really important for us to think about structural violence as, as bad as um, subjective violence is in the general population's understanding of what violence is. And um, for the purpose of my paper, I kind of define violence as a general force which diminishes the physical and mental welfare of another. So it basically takes away from another civil liberties in some way over time, not civil liberties, but another's welfare. It can be like over time, mentally, physically, anything like that. Um, and as a disclaimer, my paper is not to argue for more gore and un unnecessary violence in film and art, as I understand that there is a large movement sort of towards lessening violence in film, but this, the kind of violence that I'm talking about, it would be more instrumental in a political allegorical kind of way. So for the purpose of my research, um, Parasite was a perfect example of using art to reimagine violence. Parasite is a film by Bong Joon-ho and it approaches class structures and dominant social relations and expresses a parasitic relationship between a poor family and a richer family and expresses the manifestation of structural violence in a physical, subjective, interpersonal way. And I think it's really important because it won Best Picture and there's clearly a large appetite for this sort of commentary on social relations in art today. 
And also with my research, I found that the philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre's work really coincided with what I was thinking about with um, the movie Parasite. Um, he talks about dominant social relations, which are the type of relations between that are um, examined in Parasite with the lower class family having to rely on the upper class family for to live and the upper class family needing to rely on the lower class family for, for tutoring, for driving to work, basically to live as well, but just in a flipped way. Um, and he also talks about how structural violence is embedded in the capitalist worker dichotomy and it's um, latent and not always acknowledged, but it's always there underpinning everything. And he focuses on scarcity of goods as an important factor, so he goes into economics of it. And most importantly, he argues that without addressing structural violence, one is complicit within it, which is where I find um, the where I find to be the most important part of the research. I think that it's something that affects everyone, and something that we should think about more often. So why why art? Why would art be a good way to go about reimagining violence? Narrative art structures help to shape popular understanding of concepts and art is readily consumed and accessible. Whereas academia, which is where a lot of the conversations about objective and subjective violence like Sartre it happens um, rather than like in the news, the way that we think about violence is kind of separated, but art can kind of bridge that gap because it's very easily um, consumable. And it's really it really helps to shape people's understandings of concepts. And Parasite faces the audience with this new perspective. So Parasite was one example of this. And I, I believe that most people would agree rationally that so structural violence does pervade a lot of aspects of our lives, but we often don't think about violence in the same way, maybe due to the, the way that the law expresses violence due to narratives that are in the news, those kind of things. But if we start to reimagine it, probably a lot of us, most of us would agree that something can be done about it if we thought about it more often. And there's also a running colonial narrative in Parasite that coincides with the concept of violence really intelligently. So with the theme of the son, the rich, with the rich son's um, birthday party, his theme is cowboys and Indians. And throughout the film, we see that the son has an affinity for the, the narrative of the Native American and the um, cowboys. Um, which is basically the colonial narrative of dominance in the US where the Native American voice is, is lost and it's it's for the purpose of the US, um, the US's narrative of what happened. So with this coupled with the actual violence that we see on screen, the interpersonal violence, um, it shows the implosion of the subjective and objective violence throughout the film really nicely with that kind of imagery of the colonial narrative along with the violence. And that scene of violence is really important in Parasite. It's basically the culmination of everything I was mentioning. Um, and observing it goes against our, another thing is that observing the violence on the screen goes against our rational senses, just as does observing, observing objective violence in our daily lives, which we kind of sometimes ignore anything like that, if we're used to it. And also the character Gunse is really important. If you don't know who Gunsei is, um, there is a couple living in the basement of the richer family's home, basically going insane and um, having to steal food from upstairs and basically just live off of the upper class family again in a parasitic way. Um, and I think the loss of his sanity also speaks to objective violence. Um, the deteriorating of his mental health over time is also a form of violence that, um, is really well addressed in Parasite. And just to end, I have a quote from Sartre, which I thought um, tied in well with the research. He said, it is the moment of the boomerang. It is the third phase of violence. It comes back on us, it strikes us, and we do not realize any more than we did the other times that it is we who have launched it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Emma. Um, our next presenter is Justin Mark, um, or uh, JJ Mark. JJ Mark is an undergraduate student at Creighton University. 
this paper was developed through a collaboration with English professor Dr. Um, Serpi V. Malik and, observed, and incorporates the disciplines of literature, political science, philosophy, and ethics to, re to address refugee um, simulation events. Um, and the title is Lessons from Refugee Literature for Ethical Re Refugee Simulation Events. All righty. Thank you, Emma. Um, so you guys can see my screen there. Um, so uh, before I'd like to begin, I would like to thank again, a special thanks to Dr. Malik um, and to you, Emma and the Pamela organization for hosting this, as well as my parents. Uh, they're on the Zoom, so special shout out to them. Um, but with that, we can kind of get started. Um, so maybe if the PowerPoint works. Um, so the research question I explored is what makes a refugee simulation event ethical? And my argument consists of three components and we'll go through each of them individually, but I just wanted to lay it out first. So one, a person is aware of the delicate balance between being the migrant and the limitations of the model Two, the simulation takes into context historical and political factors. And three, the simulation focuses on the everyday mundane experiences of the migrant. Before we get into the argument itself, I wanted to take a little time for some background um, and first kind of define what a refugee simulation event is. So refugee simulation events are experiences designed to help create awareness, arouse emotions, and encourage participants to take action on behalf of refugees. Um, one example of this is an event done by the Red Cross in which participants um, had a six hour journey um, traversing like war zones um, and were subjected to violations of their human rights um, as represented through the taking of participant tokens. And these are becoming increasingly popular worldwide. Um, but the thing about them is that there are no set criteria or rules for them, which is where my research comes in because I argue for kind of a general baseline um, three components that should be in each to make sure they're done correctly. And then the next background question is kind of why use literature? Um, and to that, I would say literature is by nature other centered, meaning it shifts the focus from one cell to the other through its presentation of characters. So in other words, it presents examples, um, including of refugees. But beyond that, literary analysis um, takes it one step further and provides um, the consequences and the ethics of these betrayals, um, which is so crucial for refugee simulation events because in these experiences, they present a character, um, in this case, a refugee to a participant in hopes of generating a specific response. So by using literature as a blueprint, which presents, has presented refugees differently, it turns ethics, something that is generally abstract, and hard to define, into something concrete that can be then used for the event. And the book I will be using is Mosin Amin's novel, Exit West, um, along with literary critiques of it. The first component is a critical participant. And this recommendation comes from the narrative form of a novel. So authors have specific, specific um, pressures, agendas, and desires when writing stories that all impact the narratives they create. So if we turn to Exit West, Hamid depicts the migrant as a universal human, in which we are all migrants. And this is seen in the novel. Uh, Hamid has several, one of the plot lines is that refugees can actually travel anywhere via magical doors and they go to anywhere in the world. Um, and he kind of interjects the story with this. Um, so that kind of encourages that concept of the universal humanity. But taking into account this narrative form is so crucial for the reader because without acknowledging it or recognizing it, there's no real grappling with the issues of the lesson that Hamid is trying to give. And when applying this refugee simulation events, you know, they're not stories, yes, but they're still free, not free of bias. And by that, I mean, if you consider the groups putting on the event, whether it be a university or nonprofit, they will have their biases. But more importantly, I think the, own part, the participant has their own preconceived beliefs. And, you know, I don't really need to explain, people are, are a product of what they came from, what they believe, and in order for the, part, the um, experience to really be done right, the participant must be aware of their own preconceived notions and what they bring to the table as they go through it. The second component is the inclusion of historical and political factors. And this is actually something that is missing in Exit West because of that universal human. And Yogita Goyle, who's a literary critic, she 
She sums it up brilliantly in this quote. Hamid naturalizes the fact of migration in a way that evacuates the specific historical experience that generates it, rendering Baino what must remain historical. In the novel, there's never a mention of any city, place, or country. And admittedly, this does generate a feeling of closeness with the two characters as they go throughout the novel. But I would argue that it actually does a great disservice to migrants and refugees everywhere because it omits their origin story um, and you're not getting the full story. So one way to kind of think of this is in an analogy is, you know, if you walk into a room and there is a spot on the floor, yes, you can mop up the floor, but if you really want to save yourself all the work, you should fix the leak in the ceiling. And so when you're addressing migrants and refugees, the experience must get the full story. And by that, I mean the inclusion of the historical and political factors and the origins, because without it, you know, you're really not addressing the main issue of the refugee. My third component is the inclusion of the mundane everyday. And I would argue that it does two things. It unites us and frees us. And if we consider uh, uniting first, the everyday creates our commonalities with one another and thus becomes the basis for our relationships, which is especially important with people from very different backgrounds. And so to illustrate this, we can turn again to Exit West. Um, one example uh, in the novel is Nadia, who is one of the main characters, streaming music from the internet. And this is not something that is generally very noteworthy to the plot, but to gloss over this, I would argue misses the brilliance of the novel because this small detail is a way in which the reader, like myself, actually identifies with Nadia because I I have downloaded music off the internet and it might be one of the few things I have in common with her as she goes throughout the story. So even in little things like that, it, it becomes the basis for relationships and uniting across cultures and times. On the flip side, I would also argue that the everyday can also free us from our judgments and preconceived ideas because it challenges our deepest insecurities. So the everyday is what we experience the most. It's kind of a fact of life, you know, in our daily lives, our routines, our schedules, they're all so familiar and comfortable to us so if we interrupt this or probe this, then this should generate the most feeling of what we call alterity, which is the suspension of judgment and literature um, and the precise location of ethics. Um, so again, using an example, because I know it's kind of hard to conceptualize. Um, one example of this is the quote, um, it's on page 87. Without work, there's no impediment to Saeed and Nadia meeting during the day except for fighting. And the genius of this quote lies in Hamid's ability to kind of downplay the violence almost like it's an everyday experience, when in reality, I mean, this is not the case for much of the world. And so when you read this as a reader, it, if you really take it in, it's really kind of, you really confront a much different everyday if you put yourself in their shoes. You know, I don't have violence when I go see my girlfriend. So it should lead to kind of that severe reconsideration of others. Um, and just one more time, because I know it's a little tricky. My argument is basically that the viability of everyday life consists in our ability to engage fully with a system, but a system that we know. So if you change the system, you reawaken the mind. And one example of this that can be done in an actual event is just like having the participants sleep on the ground with a blanket or having them brush their teeth with baking soda and vinegar. That is something that unites us because everyone brushes their teeth, everyone sleeps, but it also is something we take the most comfort in. So unites us and frees us. Um, kind of some final takeaways. These are the three components that I would argue for. By no means are they an exhaustive list. Um, why is it important? I have a huge portion of this in my paper about why this is important, but it's kind of becoming more self-explanatory now, um, which is the refugee crisis is growing. Um, look at the situation in Afghanistan. Um, and you know, how, how does the world react? How does the world be ready to take in these refugees um, not rightly, but with empathy and care. And I would argue that one place to start is ethical refugee simulation events, and then more specifically, ethical refugee simulation events with these three components. So thank you. Thank you so much, JJ. Our next presenter is um, Ali McCoy.
Ali McCoy is a third year undergraduate student at the University of Southern California, uh, majoring in English with an emphasis on creative writing and minoring in songwriting and Italian. She takes a particular interest in the role of music and language as a means of effective storytelling and is an accomplished singer songwriter herself. Under her name, her alternative rock music can be found on all streaming platforms ranging from Spotify to SoundCloud. That's so cool. Um, and um, her paper for today is Emo Music as a Means of Catharsis for Adolescent Listeners Struggling with Depression. Hi, everyone. And thank you so much to Emma and to Dahlia for helping me and for my um, professor, um, Dr. Osborne, for introducing me to this um, conference and for helping me throughout the process of it. Um, Today, I'll just be showing a picture that's I think is extreme that I found online that I find extremely representative of the emo community and subculture. So I'll be if I can share screen. I'll just share that while I read a condensed version of my paper. So yeah, this is the classic emo kid. So this is this is the mental image we have. Um, so, Emo music is generally associated with preteens and teens of the early 2000s, like this young woman, who wore their hair in front of their faces, sported heavy eyeliner and fingerless gloves, and frequented the counterculture pop culture shop, Hot Topic, in order to hunt for the newest panties in stock. Headphones fastened to their ears, they shut out the real world and immerse themselves in discographies that explore death and depression in a theatrical, emotionally evocative manner. Today, emo music is still being listened to Nostalgically, a newer rock artist like Willow Smith have been citing 2000s emo musicians as inspirations for their work. Although mainstream media, parents and music critics alike worry that listening to emo music can heighten adolescent angst and suicidality, research and receptions of emo music and sad music more broadly shows that engaging with emo bands generally serves as a helpful coping mechanism in dealing with the depression that was probably already felt by emo kids before they started listening to bands like My Chemical Romance. However, even though emo music is generally more cathartic than provocative, the emo subculture has a tendency to embrace self-destructive self means of seeking help. Uh, and as for context, emo music um, is short for emo core, which was a um, strain of hardcore punk in the mid 1980s that was notable for obsessions with feelings as opposed to politics, anger and smashing up stuff like the punk scene of that era. Um, the first bands that could be considered emo were Rights of Spring and Embrace, and they drifted focus from rebelling against societal standards and instead began to hone in on the individual sadness felt by the rejects of, of said societal standards. The music was more a lament than a battle cry, a sign of exhaustion and despair felt by punks losing hope that they could actually change the world. However, the emo perspective and the music that came out of it wasn't immediately embraced. The music was and continues to be derided by haters and critics for being overly weepy and self-indulgent. Even those that loved emo bands simultaneously rejected the term while claiming ownership, according to Greenwald in his book, Everything Hurts. However, by the dawn of the 21st century, and with the help of bands like My Chemical Romance, Panic at the Disco, and Paramore, emo music crept up from out of the underground and made its way into public consciousness. Songs like Helena by My Chemical Romance and Misery Business were played on popular rock and alternative stations and were lauded not only for their raw, heartfelt sound, but also because their music was genuinely infectious. Whereas other early 2000s Billboard hits, hits like Don't Stop the Music or Buy You a Drink, um, focus on getting drunk, spending money and dancing to the club, emo music reminded their adolescent listeners that they're the, not the only ones who perceive the world as an imperfect place. While the punks of the 80 and 90, 80s and 90s railed against the apartheid and capitalist greeds and hopes of creating a better future, kids of the 21st century began to lose hope that there even was a future worth fighting for. Cue the sad, raging music called emo, which hoped that at least the afterlife would be better than the here and now. However, when emo music exploded on the scene, the genre was met with heavy criticism, who feared that emo was inextricably linked with the rise of self-harm and suicidality seen in young people. After the suicides of self-proclaimed Australian emo kids, Jody Gator and Stephanie Geister in 2007, the Sydney Morning Herald asserted that self-harm, a risk factor for suicide, has become common among adolescents, particularly girls in emo and goth cliques, enabling critics to draw eerie comparisons between the lines of My Chemical Romance's, a My Chemical Romance song called Thank You for the Venom and Gator's last post on MySpace. While the leader of MCR, Gerard Way, cries, give me all your poison, give me all your pills, and give me all your hopeless hearts to make me ill. Gator's last words on MySpace read, it's over for me, I can't take it. I hear it over and over again, it feels like it always rains. 
both convey feelings of extreme hopelessness for way on one hand believes that neither religion nor medical assistance can save him. Well, Gator can't find a plausible way out of her own rainy world. However, is it presumptuous to assume that Gator followed through with her suicidal ideations solely because of emo lyric lyrics that lied in songs like thank you for the venom. Well, there certainly can be links drawn between Gator and Geyser's obsession with emo music and their interest in suicide. Scientific data from the American Association of Suicidology suggests that music and videos with graphic content can only prime implicit cognition related to suicidality. After two sets of experiment in which the moods of college student volunteers who watched Ross music videos with and without suicidal contact were compared, the experimenters concluded that engaging with graphic content with um, emotionally heavy videos do not affect variables associated with increased suicide risk. In short, the ideations of the students examined probably didn't begin once they were exposed to the imagery. Moreover, emo kids likely didn't start feeling depressed once they began listening to bands like My Chemical Romance. As more pro plausible that the suicidality of both the college students and the emo kids was a latent problem long before mu morbid music became popular. Pediatrician Brian Primack confirms in an NPR article written by Nancy Shute that it's more likely that depressed teenagers are turning to music for solace rather than music being the cause of the mental illness. Like all people who are attracted to sad music, emo kids are just looking for validation from other people that feeling sadness is a universal part of the human experience, not something that is subscribed to just them alone. Therefore, one can make the further connection that those who identify with emo music and engage in health self-harm after immersing themselves, themselves in the subculture are probably likely to have had at least self-harms prior to listening to L Numb by Linkin Park. Brendan and Yuri of Panic at the Disco and Haley Williams of Paramore, it appears, don't turn otherwise happy kids into suicide stories. Nevertheless, emo chat rooms are known for discussing and sharing practices of self-injury, namely cutting. A habit is slitting one's wrist in order to transfer extreme emotional anguish into physical pain. According to BMC psychiatry, this form of self-injury performs a clear and social and communicative function among emo teenagers. And thin, thin scars along the underside of one's arms are often seen as a visual marker of the emo identity. However, cutting is considered to be an NSSI, a non-suicidal self-injury, which has a four-factory explanatory model. Intrapersonal negative reinforcement, interrupt intrapersonal positive reinforcement, interpersonal positive reinforcement, and interpersonal negative reinforcement. So while the interpersonal motivations behind NSSI relate to feelings of depression within the actor, the interpersonal motivations suggest that the actors are inclined to commit self-harm in order to gain entry into the community, namely the emo subculture. This turns the emo community into a scene that goes beyond accepting others for feeling alone and hopeless. It demands that their members feel this way on some level. If emo kids aren't inclined to feel discomfort at the hands of their own depression, they can acquire a similar kind of pain by cutting themselves. However, it is unlikely that an emo could be willing to hurt themselves if they weren't at least feeling some level of internal anguish. After all, doing something like that is, seriously is a seriously painful ideal and is not an easy thing to cover up. Yet members of the subculture, whether they um, harm themselves more for interperson intrapersonal or interpersonal reasons, they're not trying to kill themselves altogether. Hence why, this practice is deemed a non-suicidal self-injury. The practice can therefore be better understood as a cry for help. Although this kind of self-harm indicates some sort of mental illness that needs to be treated, it is not necessarily an indicator of suicidality. Like seeing kids' attraction and morbid music in the first place, it is the practice is more of a manifestation of latent mental health issues. Although newspaper publications like the Sydney Morning Herald were eager to soften the tragedy of Gaynor and Geiser's suicides by scapegoating emo, the idea that emotionally evocative music is dangerous is inconsistent with research behind adolescence's attraction to sad music. In fact, listening to sad music is associated with a number of healthy and adaptive behaviors, namely absorption and reflectiveness, where absorption enables the maximization of performance and the effective reduction of stress. Reflectiveness enables individuals to engage in cognitive processing of negative emotions, thereby motivating the, neg the development of strategies for changing the situation that cause the negative emotions and ultimately needed leading, to mood leading to mood improvements. Moreover, the abstract in a 2015 research study by Frontiers in Human Neuroscience clarifies that sadness evoked by music is actually found to be pleasurable when it is perceived as non-threatening, when it is aesthetically pleasing, and when it produces psychological benefits such as mood regulation, empathetic, empathic feelings, caused, for example, by recollection of and reflection on past events. In short, listening to sad music generates a paradoxical phenomenon, in which listeners feel better because hearing other talk, other people talk about their struggles with sadness confirms that at the very least they're not alone in their feelings. 
thanks to social media platforms like MySpace, which got us started in the early 2000s and now is TikTok, adolescents identifying with emo could connect with one another and help each other find a sense of belonging. Leslie Simon and Trevor Kelly's Everybody Hurts even claims that a person's emo-ness correlates with the number of friends that that person has on MySpace. They go on to say that a true emo eight might not have anyone to talk to walk home with after school, but they sure have a maxed out aim buddy list and 10 Fred requests waiting for them for approval for them on MySpace. Just like how emo kids approached music differently from most other young people, they approach friendships in a similarly distinct fashion. In their world, the online space was just as valid as meaningful as the real world. Friends for life weren't born out of the people they were assigned to work with in a group project in school, but instead out of chat rooms and blog posts that manifested in actually meeting up at places like Vans Warped Tour. So all in all, the subculture isn't perfect because of the heavy handed depictions of self harms. There's potential for it to veer towards self harm and suicidality. Yet research suggests that inclination towards suicide after listening to the morbid content embedded in emo music is not supported by research. Alternatively, sourcing out emo music and connecting with its lyricism, imagery, and community has the ability to counsel youth out of depressive episodes. Hopelessness among teenagers will continue to persist if they feel like as they're if they feel as though they're being neglected. But that sense of instability, no matter what the scale, is a part of life that they will have to deal with at some point or another. Email music, dark and gruesome as it may be, can be the coping mechanisms that allows the next generation, the next great musician, scientist, or politician to live past their adolescent years and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Allie. Um, our next presentation um, is, our, our next presenter is um, Kayla Buchanan. Kayla Buchanan is a first year college freshman from Severn, Maryland in uh, and Arundel County. She is currently an undecided major, but has plans to major in history and minor in English. And her paper for today is titled, Failure Caused by Ambition in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Hi, so I'm gonna be reading my literary analysis on Frankenstein. In the novel, Frankenstein, in the novel Frankenstein, a reoccurring theme is ambition and its effects on those who blindly follow their desires while not taking into account the consequences of their actions. Ambition leads to failure for Victor Frankenstein, the creature, and Robert Walton. Mary Shelley uses a parallel structure to demonstrate this theme in the three characters' journey while they're in pursuit of their respective goals. The creation of the creature demonstrates Victor's ambition. The novel opens with Walton, an English explorer, sending letters to his sister back in England. Walton finds Victor, a Swiss scientist, chasing a, a man-like creature that he's created across the ice of Russia. After Victor learns of Walton's plans to go to the North Pole, Victor recounts his own stories of ambition and failure. Victor starts from his childhood and he reveals that he has very few connections, only consisting of his family and a single friend named Henry Clerval. Due to this lack of social ties, Victor, Lars Lundford claims that Victor does not value life. In his work entitled The Devaluing of Life and Shelley's Frankenstein, Lunsford claims that one thing that is more important to Victor than life is maintaining his social status. This is one of the reasons that Victor doesn't support the creature because he's embarrassed of him. Uh, because he's embarrassed of him. Uh, Victor has no concern for others' life, which gives him no remorse in using the deceased to create his creature. It takes him two years isolated from his family to create this creature. And in that time, his ambition takes a toll on his health. Victor loses sleep, stops caring for the creature and grows ill. But then when he stops creating the creature, his health improves, demonstrating his illness is born from his ambition. The failure as a result of this ambition is the creature himself. The creature is responsible for the death of everyone that Victor mentioned he has a connection with. William Frankenstein, the youngest Frankenstein sibling is the first victim of the creature and by proxy, Victor's ambition. The creature finds and kidnaps the child to keep as his own. And he only kills the child when he screams for M. Frankenstein, which is the boy's father. And the creature confuses that for Victor. And he kills, this, he kills the child as, out of revenge for Victor. The creature then proceeds to frame Justine Moritz, a servant for the Frankenstein's family. Instead of confessing for the creation of the creature and exonerating Justine, Victor keeps him himself. He doesn't want to lose his status in society, so he watches Justine die. The final two victims come towards the end of the novel. The creature, after having his own journey with ambition and failure, offers Victor a deal that if he creates him a mate, he'll leave him forever. At first, Victor agrees and starts creating this creature. 
Victor sees his creature in the window and sees him as a representation of his failure. He stops working on the creation and the creature in return kills Elizabeth and Victor's fiance, Henry Cler or Elizabeth, Victor's fiance, and then Henry Clerval. His only social connections, his only chance of maintaining his high status have been destroyed by his own creation, by his ambition. These acts are a result of Victor not taking care of his responsibilities and letting his ambition to maintain his social status blind him. The creature fol follows in Victor's footsteps by depriving him of his humanity in order to pursue his ambitions, which lead to the creature's failure in form of rejection and isolation. That isolation and rejection accumulate into an eventual descent into a hateful rage as demonstrated later in the novel. The creature constantly desires acceptance because he's denied love and care from the moment of his conception and he never receives acceptance throughout the text. The first interaction the creature has with, hum with human society is Victor. And then the creature is rejected and abandoned by him. And this mention about parental neglect and abandonment is something that Henry C. Greeley details in his journal article, Frankenstein in a Modern Bioscience, which story should we heed? Greeley argues that Shelley wanted to highlight the fact that not having a parental influence will lead to the act the reader sees the creature commit. And ultimately it's Victor's fault that the creature commits murder. The creature does not gain any companionship later in the text from Victor. After listening to the creature's story, Victor still asserts that quote, when I looked upon him, I saw the filthy mass that moved and talked. My heart sickened and my feelings were altered to those of horror and hatred, end quote. Regardless if Victor is justified in hating the creature or not, the creature has no companion and no one who cares for him, as he's also rejected by society as a whole. The creature alone, after being abandoned by Victor, walks into a nearby hut. The man sitting inside shrieks when he sees him and immediately flees. The creature doesn't understand why, and so he goes to sleep. And the next morning, he wanders into a village, and while in this village, the people stone him, trying to kill him. This assault leads to one of the most formative interactions a creature has with the human race. He, after being chased out of that village, he hides in a small dwelling adjacent to a cottage with a family named the DeLacy's. They consist of a, of a father, only referred to as DeLacy, his children, Felix and Agatha, and then later on a woman named Safi. The creature grows to see these people as family. He decides after two months to introduce himself to the father because he's blind and he wouldn't judge him solely based on his appearance. At first, the interaction goes well, but it soon deteriorates after Felix, Agatha, and Safi come home. After finding him in the home with the Lacey, the creature details how physically, physically, how Felix physically assaults him, fearing he was a danger to his family. Quote, he dashed me to the ground and stuck me violently with a stick. I could have torn him limb from limb, end quote. The creature shows anger and rage towards human and the Lacey family in particular, foreshadowing his violent behavior that happens later on. These feelings demonstrate a change in the creature and a presence of emotion that he hasn't shown in any other interaction he has with humans. This creature sees this as a betrayal by his family because he's grown so attached to them. While with the DeLacy's, he wants to read and write in order to be more connected to human society. By trying to be more connected to society, his character change is creating a rage that we see towards the DeLacy's and other characters later on. In his journal article entitled Werther and Frankenstein and the Gerian Mediated Desire, Austria Orlean Tantilio argues that because the creature reads books and misunderstands their meaning, he contributes to his own feelings of loneliness and despair. He reads The Ruins or The Mediation of Revolutions of Empire and The Law of Nature by C.F. Balney while living with the DeLacy's. Tantilio argues that the creature should have learned a lesson of independence rather than dependence and revenge. This change of character is demonstrated in the vengeance he claims against mankind after being shot in the woods by a stranger. Quote, I vowed eternal hatred and vengeance to all mankind, end quote. These feelings of hatred are dramatically different from the creature who wanted to learn and be connected to humankind only a few months ago, which accumulate when the creature decides to commit suicide on Walton ship because of the isolation and rejection he feels. The creature has failed in achieving acceptance. He has failed in his ambitions. While the creature desires love and acceptance, Walton desires fame and notoriety and his desire to do so causes his failure. Walton, desire, Walton opens and closes the novel with letters to his sister. Before he meets Victor, in these letters, he, disguise how, he discusses how likely it is that he'll die and how dangerous his journey is and how brave he is for pursuing something like this for the betterment of his country. And he does it to solidify his legacy because that legacy outweighs life itself. He wants to ensure these letters reach his sister. So if and when he does die, people see him as a brave hero. When him and his crew 
are stuck in ice, they plead for him to turn around, almost to the point of a mutiny. And he only does so when Victor dies. Victor seems to be the only friend Walton has because he's entranced by Victor. As he described in his work entitled The Molding of a Scientist Individual in Frankenstein, Shamil Taha Abdullah states that both the men have a strong passion for learning that ignites their ambitions. Victor is an upper-class man of science and he is everything that Walton aspires to be. This is the reason that Walton listens to Victor in the first place. These ambitions that Walton exhibits lead to nothing but failure and he only survives because he surrenders to these ambitions and gives up on his goal. Walton fails at his goals because he is too ambitious in pursuit of them. His ending is not as tragic as his counterparts because he does not demonstrate the same hubris that Victor and the creature do. Walton's failure is evident. He doesn't reach the North Pole. Many of his crewmates die. He doesn't become famous and he, does, he, his only, he loses his only friend. Walton is different from Victor and the creature in that he doesn't lose his life in pursuit of his goal. This is where Shelley's message is exemplified because she compares Walton and Victor's storyline to warn against hubris, which is the abundance of arrogance, pride, and ambition. David Higgins in the chapter Walton the Explorer in his book Frankenstein Character Studies compares Walton and Frankenstein in their respective character arcs and whether or not the two men had learned anything from one another and their journeys in totality. He concluded that neither had learned anything, claiming Walton's turn at the end of the novel showed signs of failure, not growth. Walton is willing to fail and learn from his travels and adventure, so his ending is much less tragic than Victor's whose ambition and arrogance blinds him from being able to fail. Walton demonstrates in a letter by saying, I had, quote, I had rather die than return shamefully my purpose unfulfilled after hearing Victor's story of ambition. This shows that Walton does turn around at the end of the novel, but it's because he failed. It's not because he become less ambitious or because he learned anything, it's because he got of options. The source of failure for the three characters of Frankenstein is ambition, which was an intentional message by Mary, that Mary Shelley, Mary Shelley wanted to convey. Thank you. Excellent. Um, our last speaker for today is um, uh, Felicia Wulandari. Felicia Wulandari is a public relations student at the University of Southern California. She has long cultivated a passion for writing, be it in the form of short stories, speeches, or screenplays. Her published work can be found on Everyday Fiction. And um, her, the title of her paper today is Whiplash and Soul, How Two Films Diverge in the Representation of a Starving Artist. Give me one second, just pull this up. Uh, first of all, thank you, Emma, for mediating the session, and thank you as well for Professor Osborne and my mentor, Scott, for helping me finish this paper. I'm going to start immediately because... Oh, uh, one, yeah. quick thing, um, one quick interruption. Um, mm -hmm. Alicia is not our last presenter. I did forget about Elizabeth Kim, so don't worry, Elizabeth, you are not forgotten. I will, you will be next. But okay. you, you can continue now. All right, so this was a complete coincidence. But while I was researching this paper, Hollywood was apparently about to witness one of the biggest strikes in its history. And it didn't happen because the studios and the union reached an agreement before a production Armageddon happened. But you know, if it had, over 60,000 people comprising of technicians, um, artisans, and craftspersons would have stopped working to protest for better wages and better working conditions. And, you know, this isn't something that's surprising to me. It's probably not surprising for all of, for all of you because, you know, there's always mm. this persistent um, narrative around artists that they need to starve for their craft, that they need to suffer for their craft, that, you know, they should refuse any commercial opportunities because they would cause their creative ingenuity, that they should be very single-minded in their pursuit uh, for art you know, oftentimes resulting in a neglect of their physical, emotional, financial, um, mental needs. And for those who have been deep in this kind of belief, you know, they think the suffering while it's growing is justified because it's authentic and purposeful and somehow promises greatness. And now the strike didn't happen, obviously, 
but it shows that there's this change in the winds, you know, that artists everywhere are asking for an alternative story for themselves that is kinder and more humane. And the big question now is what kind of narrative? And in this presentation, I'm not going to be proposing an answer. I'm going to be bringing in a film that proposes an answer to that question. And, um, sorry, and um, that film is Soul. And to make the comparison more uh, obvious, I'm going to be bringing a fil another film that endorses the idea of the suffering artist, and that film is Whiplash. So my argument is that while Whiplash romanticizes the notion of the suffering artist, Soul challenges the merits of the notion. And Soul argues that um, while suffering may lead to greatness, it doesn't necessarily lead to self-fulfillment. So let's move on to Whiplash. So what is Whiplash all about? Whiplash is a story about an ambitious jazz student named Andrew Newman and his tyrannical teacher, Terence Fletcher, basically. And even though that's like the general plot line underneath that, there's this story of Andrew Newman becoming the starring artist. You know, the, the, the film is basically showing his torturous journey to reach a, an artistic greatness. And, you know, this notion of reaching greatness, it, it taps into our innate sort of primal desire. Um, and this is not just something that appeals to regular people like us. You know, it even captivates the German philosopher Nietzsche, who also said in his book, you know, aside from proclaiming that God is dead, he also said that mankind must toil unceasingly to bring forth individual great men. And this kind of goal seems okay because humanity have always, you know, moved forward and advanced because of great people. But it doesn't stop here. And this is where the, cost, the question gets a bit uncomfortable. You know, like, how do we achieve this? How do we bring forth um, individual great men? And um, Whiplash has an answer to this question. You know, there's, there was a quote um, asked here by Fletcher, the teacher. He asked his, his student, like, you know, why did Charlie Parker, a really great jazz musician, how did he become Charlie Parker, Andrew? And Andrew said, because Joe Jones threw a symbol at him. So that shows something, right? This notion of suffering, you know, that it is critical to greatness. It's not just something that the film endorses. It's also endorsed by Nietzsche himself. And if you look into the characteristics of individual great men, you know, according to his conception, it sort of aligns with the behaviors and characteristics of the starving artists, you know, like desiring inclusion, you know, willingness to pursue a solitary path because you're so busy with doing your art, you don't really think about anything else, and then you have very, um, uh, very great um, drive to pursue artistic greatness, and oftentimes you have to endure suffering. And essentially, the entire movie of Whiplash, like I said, it's this journey of fulfilling this, of going through this journey of becoming this great individual, of becoming the starving artist. You know, if you look into the film, I don't know if you've seen it, but, you know, Andrew um, increasingly becomes isolated from his family. He breaks up from his girlfriend and all that because he needs time to practice and practice and practice, right? And the entire film, you know, it's an hour and 40 minute film. It's technically a testimony to how driven he was in trying to achieve his goal. And it's also a testimony to his mental strength in enduring the suffering, the abuse that he had to go through under Fletcher, just so that he could reach, you know, he could become the greatest um, 20th century musician. So, um, and did he make it, you know, by the end of the film, did all his suffering become fruitful? Well, apparently the movie says yes, you know, because we have this scene at the end, if you remember the very adrenaline pumping ending of the movie, you know, um, it, it, it's, it makes you an awe. Because I, when I watched it, I was both dis disturbed and in awe because what I saw on screen was, wow, not a lot of people can do that. We're just witnessing a human, a normal human being reaching for greatness and he succeeded. But if you're a critical um, viewer, you would be like, okay, maybe in that moment, yes. But what comes after? Does he continue to prevail in greatness? 
the film doesn't answer that and it's a very deliberate move um, but you know if a psychologist called abraham maslow allowed you know has the opportunity to answer that question he would probably say no so Maslow is the psychologist who was known for um, his theory of human motivation. He came up with this model of hierarchy of needs. Basically, he said that everybody tends to try to achieve self-actualization. But in order to do so, they need to fulfill the bottom parts of the pyramids right here, the four ones. They need to fulfill those needs first before they could achieve this. But he also acknowledges that a lot of people take a non-linear way to climb the pyramid. Sometimes they go jump, they jump here, they don't fulfill the needs here. They just, um, you know, they they don't take it, you know, from bottom to top. And apparently, there are eight archetypes that classify people based on how they try to fulfill this hierarchy of needs. One of them, interestingly is called The Starving Artist. So what is The Starving Artist? So this is an excerpt, uh, not an excerpt, a paraphrase of uh, the argument made by this professor from the Fry University. He said that The Starving Artist is actually somebody who pursues self-actualization when they have not satisfied the lower tiers of their needs. They think they are self-satisfied, self-actualized, when in reality, they're only engaging in self-actualizing activities. And this is sort of the argument that Sol puts forward, because if you all remember, Gardner, after he succeeded in divine death, and uh, you know he made it to the, to perform alongside with uh, Jess Legend Dorothea Williams, he had this conversation after the whole performance. He said, you know, it's like, so what happens next? Well, we come back to more night again and do it all over. And then Joe surprisingly does not you know, accept that answer with much enthusiasm. And then obviously Dorothea noticed and then she asked like, why? And then Joe answered, well, I've been waiting for this moment all my life. And he thought he'd feel different, but he didn't. So um, he goes home after, and then that's when he remembers that, you know, he went through all this adventure with 22. And that's when he realizes that the true joy that he was looking for does not lie in the performance that he was chasing throughout three quarters of the film. It actually lies in what he calls as just regular old living. So uh, the previous professor, he said something else. He said that it's possible for starving artists to realize that there are certain needs that need to be fulfilled and it's a legitimate need that you need to fulfill. You know. So that moment of the film shows when um, Joe Gartner made this realization. And 22 actually helped him undergo this um, character development. So 22, because she's never been born human, you know, she can sort of see normal things from, from new eyes, novel eyes with very exciting, um, you know, he, she can admire something that's regular, like a piece of pizza with, with, with so much um, happiness and then and so much joy. And when she overtook his body and he wants to experience, you know, the human life, the normal human life, she sort of forces him to do it with her. And what she doesn't realize is that um, jo she's actually forcing Joe to go visit this needs, these four needs that he has been neglecting all his life and actually fulfill them. So when 22 was enjoying a piece of, you know, piece of pizza and then she's just allowing all the flavors to flood her senses, you know, she's forcing Joe to fulfill here, the physiological needs. When 22 made a connection with the barber that he has actually been visiting for years, but never really made a genuine human connection, he realized, wow, so that's what it feels like to make a human genu uh, genuine human connection. He you know, she forced him to taste what it feels like to fulfill uh, the belong, belongingness and love needs. So, um, and you know, by the end of the film, because Joe has, you know, has been forced to notice that he has needs that need to fulfill, um, he finishes his character development and he ends the film with, by saying this, you know, he's not sure how he's gonna continue his life afterwards, but 
he knows that he's going to live every minute of it. And I'm going over time. But if I can leave with one more uh, thought, it's that um, the purpose of me bringing this topic forward is not to condemn the narrative of the starving artists. It's just to show artists and creatives everywhere that, hey, there's an alternative uh, story for all of you. And if it works out for you, why not? Uh, so that's all. Thank you. Okay. And thank you so much, um, Felicia. Our real um, final presenter, I'm sorry about missing you before in the order of events, um, is Elizabeth Kim. Um, Elizabeth Kim is a fourth year undergraduate at the University of Southern California. She is studying English literature and plans to apply to law school post studies. She enjoys traveling and is um, potentially interested in doing international law, specifically with a focus on South Korea. She has experience interning at various nonprofit organizations, such as Freedom Speakers International um, and Asian Journal of Peacebuilding, where she has helped to teach North Korean refugees English and helped as key professor um, at edit documents. During her free time, she enjoys taking photos, playing instruments, and playing with her dog. And her um, presentation today is North Korean Vocal Presence and Representation in South Korean Narrative Media. Hi, so can you hear me? Um, so I'm going to be talking about North Korean vocal presence and representation in South Korean narrative media. And just a quick shout out to my um, professor, Professor Osborne, who really helped me um, create and sort of helped me um, help advise my research project. So what do you think when you think of a North picture when you think of a North Korean refugee? If you never thought of this question or don't have an answer to it, you're in the same boat I was two years ago prior to traveling to South Korea to Internet Freedom Speakers International, a nonprofit organization that provides speech coaching to North Korean refugees to help spread their stories around the globe. At FSI, I did not know what to expect when I met a North Korean refugee, but I do know that I did not expect someone like Ken Um, a previous soldier in the North Korean army who decided to escape in 2010 who loves cracking jokes and has a passion for education. Or Lin He Park, who after hearing her story is one of the strongest women I've ever met and loves flashy makeup, wearing hot pants and keeps up with all the South Korean trends. My experience at FSI helped humanize these refugees as the refugees were able to represent themselves and articulate their stories and voices to individuals and audiences of me. Now around 33,000 North Korean refugees have entered South Korea since 1998. Despite receiving help from the South Korean government, such as being enrolled in immersion programs and being given citizenship, these refugees often encounter social tensions while resettling in South Korean society. Being separated from the North for so many decades, many South Korean citizens are increasingly viewing them as an other. Therefore, despite being given South Korean citizenship, more than half of the North Korean refugees claim they face discrimination. Various South Korean narrative media sources, such as TV shows, dramas, and movies, often recycle the social image of North Korean refugees as weak and helpless subjects or suspicious communist spies. Through these recurring portrayals, North Korean refugees encounter difficulties in controlling their own social image as narrative media constructs them in very eliminated binaries. I argue that North Korean refugees should have a greater vocal presence in constructing their representation in narrative media. Although they do not constitute a huge portion of the population in South Korea, they are still part of South Korean society, and some of these problematic representations can cause potential social tensions and perpetuate prejudice or wariness of North Korean refugees. The language employed in the various forms of narrative media additionally alienates North Korean refugees from society. An article from the academic journal Urban Anthropology asserts in othering languages that North Korean refugees are exposed to. Narrative media refers to them as Talbukmi, which translates to North Korean defectors. What this implies is that North Korean refugees are not identified as the legal South Koreans they are, but rather as a population who has escaped from the North and still has associations with it. Despite having a social label that they are North Korean, most refugees who inhabit South Korea for a long time actually identify themselves to be South Korean citizens. A survey conducted on the refugee identity demonstrates that when asked which community or group they are involved in, most North Korean interviewees pointed out um, occupational or professional groups that they were affiliated with in South Korea. 
The result of this survey implies that being accustomed to the South Korean lifestyle has caused a strong affiliation with the South Korean nationality. Despite originating from one of the world's most feared countries, this survey demonstrates that most North Korean refugees actually consider themselves as less from the North and more as everyday South Korean citizens. Media plays a huge role in shaping public opinion. Because most refugees keep their identity secret and they are a minority population in South Korea, most encounters with real refugees for South Koreans are only feasible through entertainment sources or current affair programs. The media showing the impoverished North leads South Korean citizens to be wary of border migrations as they take it for granted that the refugees would nat naturally wish to relocate, making South Korean citizens suspicious and more paranoid about spies that are, that are disguised as refugees. Alongside this image, various entertainment programs capitalize the image of an exotic and vulnerable North Korean beauty and discredit the stories of multiple North Korean refugee women who wish to show their strength and courage. We can see how narrative media recycles these fairly limiting images that orient itself around gaining media hype. The South Korean film Hand of Fate was released in 1954, only a decade after Korea was divided. This film follows the story of a cafe waitress who is actually in love with a North, who is actually a North Korean spy and falls in love with a South Korean counter spy. The couple lament that their love is impossible, and this is symbolized by the presence of the 38th parallel. Their love is obstructed by the social boundaries that are represented by the physical one. Like how a singular peninsula is split into two, they too must remain apart. Furthermore, this film not only um, oh, this film commends the trend to stigmatize North Korean people as communist spies. The South Korean TV show program Now Am I Made to Meet You featured a panel of dozen beautiful North Korean women and gave them a chance to speak about their daily lives in North Korea. However, this television program was controversial since it relied on emphasizing the physical appearance of North Korean refugee women to engender greater audience sympathy and create these women as objects of pity. An example is an episode where a refugee named Kimara intensely cried while she was retelling her story. The TV caption referred to her as a red-eyed beauty, and her story was overshadowed by ominous background music. The program's obsession with the appearance of these women portrays them not as individuals who are strong enough to cross the border, but rather as damsels in distress. Emphasizing that North Korean refugee woman, North Korean refugees woman appearance over her words takes over her control over her allocated media space. She transforms into an object that is meant to be seen by the public's eye rather than become a voice of her own. Therefore, although North Korean refugee women were given visibility on television, this example demonstrates how their representation was not always on their terms. An example of one of the most highly rated South Korean dramas is called Crash Landing and depicts a successful love story between a rich South Korean elite girl and a North Korean military officer. This drama slightly differs from the previous trends of South Korean narrative media as it presents a more humanized version of North Korea and its people. However, like previous representations, there are highly controversial inaccuracies and stereotype reinforcements. One example would be the North Korean townswomen who are portrayed as cute, full of gossip, and primarily housewives. Like the television programs, these North Korean women heavily value appearance, talking about clothes and cosmetics, and going to the black markets to purchase illegal South Korean makeup. In the drama, the North Korean soldiers infiltrate the South through participating in sport games. Although the scenes were intended for comedic purposes, the simplicity through which the North Korean soldiers enter South Korea leads to, lends this idea of infiltration. The drama spreads a fear that North Korean people could be walking amongst the streets and remain largely undetected. The recent popular K-drama Squid Game also contains a character that is a North Korean refugee who attempts to rescue her mother from the North and earn money to take her brother out from an orphanage. At first glance, she de deviates from the normalized representations of North Korean women, as she is incredibly clever and a great fighter. At the same time, the end of the K-drama reinforces how she is unable to fulfill her dreams of saving her own family, and must rely on a South Korean man to rescue her family for her. What does this say about North Korean refugee um, individuals by including a South Korean man to fulfill their mission for them? Although this character may deviate from the common representation, her death and her wish to have her family rescued from the orphanage questions the autonomy of North Korean refugee women. From movies to television shows to dramas, North Korean refugees reside on a platform that aims to reproduce certain stereotypes about them rather than give them proper representation and a voice to express their own stories and themselves. Moving forward, 
South Korean media needs to take the necessary steps to stop reinforcing the South Korean people's biases of refugees. By focusing less on the appearance and helpless state of North Korean refugee women, ceasing the representation of North Koreans as political spies, and giving refugees more opportunities to directly express their own stories via narrative media can help empower the refugees' voice, give them greater autonomy over their own social image, help calm the social tensions and discriminations in South Korea, and hopefully result in greater harmony between the two Korean communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of our wonderful presenters. I love the variety of great topics that we were able to cover, um, oh, that you were able to cover in all of your presentations. Um, we are just about out of time for the session itself, but um, we, um, as I said, um, Craig just did say we could go a little longer. And um, I don't think the next session starts for another 20 minutes. So we could spend a few minutes answering questions if you, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask. or any comments. Yes, I see um, Emma has a question. Oh, I just wanted to say that everyone did really well and I could tell that everyone was putting in a lot of work in their research and everyone was very knowledgeable. And I want to say thank you, Emma, for all of your help throughout the process and all of your emails. Oh, you're welcome. I loved working with all of you. Um, Trip, I see you have a question. Um, I actually, I wanted to do the same thing. It's not so much a question, but I just wanted to say that uh, all the contributions this evening were just top notch. I think they were just remarkable and fascinating. So I just want to congratulate all of you on being great scholars. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see, I see in the chat bar, um, we have a question from Carol Ann Tyler um, to, um, I believe that was Ali's um, presentation. And um, so the question is, um, one is about, uh, so the question is about cutting and um, tattooing, piercing and tattooing. Does anyone link um, uh, cutting to piercing and tattooing if they both involve a social function, um, sort of function, social function, but also involve pain? Yeah, I mean, I don't know as much about that specifically, but I mean, just through just an, my understanding, I think I don't, as far as emo goes, I don't know if tattooing was as much a part of the um, culture that, but I think sim like it's a kind of similar response to depression to, there is like a, there is a response to depression with piercings and um, tattoos is like kind of like this kind of like, like relaying this emotional pain through physical pain. Definitely piercings were a part of the emo subculture, like lip piercings, I think piercings were huge. Tattoos not, but that was kind of merely more um, just the, you know, just a preference thing. But yeah, it's definitely a common thing among adolescent or just any other um, person struggling with depression that tends to be a, a means of kind of manifesting that pain. Thank you. Uh, Martin has a question or comment? Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I, I'm tempted to just want to go down the list and say, you know, this was great, this was great, this was great, you know, and, and what was good about all of them, I'm afraid I'll leave someone out or do it inadequately. I did want to start maybe with a question for, for Gemma, uh, which is, you know, I found fascinating this idea that, um, you know, an authentic, folk song you know was never would never could nevertheless be subject to this kind of selectivity that would deploy you know um display it as nationalistic or obedient or, or what have you uh i guess what i'm wondering is you have specific examples of other authentic folk songs that actually survived that would be much different than that and you know uh you know talk, you're talking about a present moment of erasure i'm wondering you know, is, is there a recoverable or even inferable, you know, previous moment of erasures, even the ones that have survived, if that makes sense? Yeah, um, sorry, my Wi-Fi is slow, so I'm not turning on video, but um, this has been an ongoing process. Um, 
especially supported through academia in the um, recording of songs like this. So one um, example that was kind of pulled out in the research was how um, something that was preserved and that actually made it onto a UN recognized list of um, cultural and tangible um, uh, artifacts. That one was about um, being united against the threat of Russia. Um, in the same area of study, um, I think at the same time period, there was a song um, that was talking, kind of lamenting about a famine that a minority group went to went through um, and kind of unfavorably talked about the um, Chinese government in power. Um, so the researcher was able to find um, find the song, but they did note how it was kept from joining this you know internationally recognized list from being cataloged in quite as um, prestigious of a way. Um, yeah, so it's definitely an ongoing process. Um, this like performance through TV and tourism is the newest form, but in the past it was through um, kind of anthropologists and research like that. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, so did it look like Carol Ann added up the question or did we, did we combine those? I forgot. Um, no, yeah, there's another question from Carol Ann. Um, this one, I'm not sure. Um, well, I, I'll just explain. <laughs> so yeah, I was I, I was, yeah, I was really just thinking about, I was um, thinking about the uh, refugee paper that we heard, which was terrific, like all the papers. And I happened to have read the novel that our speaker discussed. And I was making a connection with a novel by Katsia called Waiting for the Barbarians, which is probably the, the novel that first like makes him famous. And it too is allegorical. And so, you know, I was uh, thinking about the link to the, the question basically of allegory as a form, as opposed to realism. And the way when we want things to be politically effective, we often fall back on the assumption that we have to make that happen through realism. So part of the modernist debates, the debates about modernism in the post-structuralist period, we're, we're trying to recover the sort of political effectiveness of modernist techniques, or at least insist that they, they were, and even that they were better than realism, which was retrograde. And so I can see like these debates actually still are live in certain ways. And it's, uh, you can see like what allegory can do has to do with the specific and therefore the opening up of an obviously symbolic dimension to it. And what's missing is the kind of specificity that anchors it in a real that people recognize. And so it's really maybe more an observation. What I loved about the novel was what I love about Waiting for the Barbarians too. <laughs> so. And yeah, and just to kind of echo that, I completely agree. And I think that's, you pretty much hit the nail on the head. Um, and you could say the same thing about the Waiting for Barbarians novel, but yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Looks like we have another question for Martin. I could just keep going. I mean, well, well just since JJ just spoke, I, I, I don't actually have a question for him, but I just want to say that was, that is exemplary interdisciplinary work just really impressive and you know maybe it flatters us as you know literary scholars that someone who's doing that kind of ethical and political work is finding a place for literary critique and making it pay off in that huge practical way and just uh that was just outstanding so i don't mean to just single you out for praise and make everyone else feel bad but i loved it so great work um question for for max uh just going down the, the line uh, i'm very interested in thinking about this fall of the agrarian ideal with, with Thomas Watson. I'm just curious, and again, this doesn't have to be your project, but maybe I'm thinking of extension of just what I said about JJ. But what about Watson's literary productions? Like he wrote a lot of biographies, and particularly like his, you know, you, you talk about 1895 kind of being a hinge year. What does his biography of Thomas Jefferson look like in 1900? What, what, is, what is the agrarian ideal like in that biography? 
And, you know, or what is, what are the racial politics, you know, in that? I don't know if you've read it, you don't have to have read it. You've done plenty of work. I'll just say what Emma said. Everyone was so knowledgeable about their field. And, you know, I'm not, this is not like a gotcha, like, did you read the, you know, every single work by this person? But I was just curious about not just his political career, but so to speak, his literary career. I'm not seeing Max. We may have lost him. Maybe there was a patchy internet signal. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize to everyone else. So, uh, sorry. I, um, I just um, checked it, didn't see him. So he, he must have just dropped, lost the internet or something along those lines. Okay, question, question for Emma then, uh, which is, um, I think really well argued this idea using these categories of you know, subjective violence, which we're familiar with and can see in this objective violence that is structural and how your film perfectly exemplifies taking objective violence and making it subjectively discernible, right? And therefore pedagogical. Uh, my question is one thing that came up uh, just quickly as a point, like you'd say, well, and it was award-winning and it was, the violence was well-received and that there was an appetite for it. Like, what is the importance of that? And what does that mean necessarily? Like I, I, cause I feel ambivalent about that aspect of like, I don't, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I could have explained that further. I guess I was trying to say that um, there's, the, just the way that Parasite had won the Best Picture Award and was so well received, like the, I meant like that the film was so well received in such like a large way. Um, I was trying to illustrate that critique of like capital systems or just like exploitative systems, those sort of things. Right now, I'm seeing a lot. This is just, I guess, um, anecdotal, but within my generation, like there's definitely growing concerns and growing, um, just like a growing appetite for that kind of critique and that sort of media. And I guess that's also illustrated with Squid Games, which I'm not quite read, but I'm. It's definitely of a similar vein. So I was trying to argue that these sorts of artistic venues um, would be an advantageous route because they can be so widely received and consumed just like Parasite was. No, oh, thank you. Uh, is, is anyone else have a hand up yet? I'll, I'll, I'll jump down to, oh, is Elizabeth still around? Yes. Um, thank you for that analysis of, of you uh, know, the way- that, Elizabeth uh, said she, she might have to run. Do you, do you have time to answer your question or do you need to go? Oh, I can stay for like two minutes. Okay. Well, to make it one minute. I'll, I'll just, I, I was really struck with you know the use of othering language and objectifying language, but that phrase "red-eyed beauty" seems so evocative of doing that work of making someone an object of pity and an aesthetic object. Is that um, a typical like phrase? You know, do you see what I'm saying? Is it an expression, or is that just something of the moment? Does that make sense? Is that a stock phrase? You know, a red-eyed beauty to talk about someone who is sad and beautiful, or um. No, not in South Korean language, but I, I have seen it pop up when um, they're talking about North Korean refugees. I think maybe it's a term that has been coined specifically for that, not not generally in the language. It's like not an idiom within our language, but I think um, within that TV program, it's a phrase that came up a lot. So it's not something you would come across in like your everyday language. But. Oh, thank you. But I mean, you did well to select it for your purposes. That was that was great. So, um, yeah, I feel like we're probably way beyond time. But uh, yeah, we still uh, we're pretty much beyond time. We we do have like the next session starts in nine minutes, so there might, we might want to give another minute or two for uh, like a minute or two give give people time to switch to another session if they want to. But we could still go for another five or six minutes. I just wanted to say, maybe it's not fair to treat two people at once, but it was fascinating to me how much Kayla and Felicia had in common about, you know, uh, the the analysis of ambition and drive and its consequences. And they were both papers that had just really well focused thesis and something to tell us and found the great examples in their texts uh, and really lively uh, you know, literary cultural analysis there. Um, so just to, to say, I like that. And, you know, I hadn't, hadn't thought of even in, in Frankenstein about the monster having its, its own journey of ambition, as you put it. You, know, you think of Victor Frankenstein as being, but the monster is ambitious too, right? That's, that's a great point. But 
And I also love the idea of there being an alternative to the, the one particular doom narrative of the um, starving artist, you know, the alternative in soul. Uh, last one, Allie, uh, kind of worked my way to the middle, uh, just packed so much into that. Uh, I mean, that's just taught us, taught us a lot. Um, I'll speak out of both sides of my mouth here, which is that from an aesthetic sense, I almost felt like it was like you had so much to say. It had it went so fast. But on the other hand, you did get it all in and I heard it all. So, you know, uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah. So thank you for sharing all of that knowledge with us. I had a question for Emma. Um, I was really interested in when you talked about how objective violence implicates everyone. And I was curious how that might play into the title Parasite where there's like that question of who does the title actually apply to? Yeah, I really like that question because I was thinking about that a lot when I was researching in the way that um, I was reading also some like interviews with the director, sort of how they're all parasitic in a way. And even you can go as far to say like, the system is just like all of it is just parasitic and it's kind of like inescapable for them to like rely on each other for their livelihoods, no matter what position they're in. Thank you. And, um, question for Kayla. Um, Kayla, I was really interested in um, you bringing in um, Walton's story, because I think that that's often forgotten in the Frankenstein research. And I was curious what, um, uh, beyond like, like he has that role of that ambitious foil, but I was curious, um, why else do you think Mary Shelley includes him as this kind of frame narrative for the book? Yeah, so I think Walton kind of is the example of like, he lets go of his ambitions towards the end of the novel. And I, I, kind, of ex I kind of explain that he doesn't, he let go because he learns anything. He let go because he fails, but he lets go and he lives. The creature doesn't let go of his ambitions. He dies. Victor doesn't let go of his ambitions. He dies. Mary Shelley wanted somebody to let go of their ambitions to show that when you let go of your ambitions, when you kind of like realize, or when you kind of, when you let go of those ambitions, you can live. You, you need to like have that mindset. You can't, you need to look back you need to take a step back sometimes and not be so entranced in what you're doing and enthralled in your ambitions to the point of you to when you reach that point of you know your failure and the ultimate failure obviously is death so I think she wanted to use him to make that point thank you Well, I think I'll call it now so that um, people have time if they want to go to the last session. But I want to thank you, all, all of our presenters, for your great pre um, presentations. Uh, they were all so clear and so well organized, and you were great at sticking to the time as well, um, which I know is a difficult um, thing, especially with it being so short. Um, there's so much more, there's so much you want to get in there, and you all did a great job with that. Um, so thank you so much. And I hope this is the first of many undergraduate forums. Thank, Thank you. you, Emma. Thanks for thanks for being the force here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Emma. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Let's Thank do it again.